The United States is known as being the home of the free and the home of the fat. Over two thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. And one of the principal drivers of this predicament is processed food addiction. How did we get so latched on to junk food? And what can we do to stop it? I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Hey everyone, welcome to Timeless. I hope that you are having a great week. Just a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below so that you can be notified when each new episode airs. And also be sure to check out my show, Julie Noted, which pertains to the biggest news stories of the day. And to follow me at Julie R. Hartman on Instagram and Twitter. Now, for those of you who do follow me at Julie R. Hartman on Instagram and Twitter, know that one of the best parts about working in this studio is that I sit with my producers after every show and eat Trader Joe's cheese puffs. Though you may think I'm kidding, I'm seriously not. It is one of the highlights of my day and I've sort of gotten addicted to it. And I went online and just looked up, you know, processed food. I just wanted to learn more about how bad cheese puffs are for you. And I stumbled across a website called processedfoodaddiction.com. It brought me to this wonderful doctor, Dr. Joan Ifland, who I'm thrilled is joining us today. She's the author of Processed Food Addiction. She's a food addiction expert and weight loss coach, and she teaches health practitioners how to use food addiction recovery to put diet-related diseases into remission. And I just started by going online, just wanting to do a little bit more research. And then lo and behold, I came across this great resource, which has led to, I guess, more of a motivation for a lifestyle change for me. And I hope for many of you, because it is such a big issue in our country, I didn't realize just how much. But here to tell us all of the facts is Dr. Joan Ifland. Hi, Dr. Ifland, thank you for joining Hi, me. Hi, Julie. I'm good, how are you today? I'm great. I'm assuming that you, by the end of the interview, are going to be telling me no more of those Trader Joe's cheese puffs, though I've learned from your well, work to avoid it. Thank you. It's, um, you know, it's a labor of love. People have no idea how processed foods are affecting them. And I'm so grateful to you for offering this opportunity to talk about it. Well, thank you. Well, to start off, I ask every person who I interview this, how did you get into this line of work? Well, I was 44 years old when I gave up sugars and flowers. I was a yo-yo dieter. I needed to lose some weight. And a person, I was in a, a support group for miserable personalities. Wow. I was a rager. I was raised by ragers. I didn't want to raise my children with raging and yet I would just pop off and start raging occasionally. And I wanted, I was just desperate for that to stop. I had done personal therapy. I had done a women's healing group. I had done the first of my four, uh, my 12 step groups, my four 12 step groups. And it wasn't helping. I was still raging. I would just have these attacks of rage in which I would be looking at myself raging and wishing it would stop. So in uh, January of 1996, to lose weight, I gave up sugars and flowers. I started eating a food plan that had a lot of food on it. And I thought this will never work for weight loss because you really, you have to be hungry and miserable and irritable to lose weight, right? Well, uh, the miracles started rolling in right away. I stopped craving. I had never not had cravings. I went to kindergarten with cravings. I can remember being in kindergarten craving. The bloating stopped. The brain fog stopped. The fatigue stopped. And I just, and I lost two pounds that week eating a lot of food. The next week it got even better. I had pretty severe allergies. Like I thought they were airborne allergies, but uh, they stopped. And then a lifelong sinus infection cleared up. I just didn't know, I just was shocked. I felt like I was winning the lottery every day. But it was in the third week when I realized I hadn't yelled at anybody in three mm. weeks. And I just instinctively knew it was about the food. 
I went to the support group that weekend. I asked, do big people become less irritable, anxious, uh, depressed on this food plan? And they all said, yeah, pretty normal. And I was shocked. All of the things I had done, nobody ever said, try changing your diet. Now, fast forward 27 years later, I immediately just committed my life to letting people know that processed foods are devastating, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And even though you may have childhood issues, I certainly have childhood issues, uh, that's not the primary driver of depression, irritability, and anxiety in our culture. It's the processed foods. Mm. You know, it seems like a miracle that your diet transitioned led to all of these these great reforms in your life, but it also is quite intuitive because think about a car. If you put terrible gas in a car, the car is not going to drive well. If the car is made with terrible equipment, the car isn't going to drive well. That's no different with human beings. And yet we think, oh, well, what we eat does, has nothing to do with all of these, these things that you mentioned, but, but clearly they do. Right. Well, suppose that you were putting bad gas in your car and it started clanking and clanking and you went to the garage and, you, and the garage said, oh, we can fix that. It give, they give you back the car, $500. And the scar, car is still clanking. But everybody around you says, oh, it's, it's the mechanic. Try a different mechanic. Right. And nobody ever mentions that it's the poor quality gas. And then maybe you figure it out. You go to a different gas station and your car is fine. And you start trying to tell everybody, no, 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 it's not the mechanic. It's the gas. It's the gas. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I know because my father told me it's the mechanic. That's where we are with this processed food issue. So let's start out by going to some, some basics and defining our terms. What is processed food? So processed food is anything that no longer looks like the plant or the animal it came from. If you eat celery, celery is green, it's long, it has fiber. And if you eat a powder, you really don't know where that came from. If you eat a carrot, a carrot looks like a carrot. If you buy an apple, an apple looks like an apple. But there's no, there's no plant that produces the image that you're putting on the screen right now. So you know that's a processed food. It's been powdered. It's been turned into a syrup. It's been turned into a liquid. It's been concentrated. The fiber has been taken out of it. So any kind of sugar, any kind of flour, especially flour that contains gluten, gluten has a natural morphine in it, gluteomorphine. It's why a lot of people are sensitive to gluten. It can, uh, excessive salt affects the same pathway as opium. Dairy has four different kinds of casomorphine in it. It's designed to put a baby cow to sleep. And then uh, excessive fats will activate the same pathways in the brain as cannabis. And then caffeine is, uh, caffeine works by blocking the calmness factor uh, in the body. And then there are food additives. So these foods are now being developed under the same addiction business model as cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And you might remember that the tobacco companies were caught isolating and adding nicotine to cigarettes to make them more addictive. Well, when they took over processed foods, they hired a consultant, Howard Moskowitz, who has a PhD in experimental psychology of marketing from Harvard. And he developed a method for maximizing the amount of sugar, fat, salt in processed foods before the, the consumer could detect it. So it was hidden. These new and vast quantities of sugar, fat, salt, which we, all, we already knew were addictive, were added to like pasta sauce and uh, canned vegetables so that they became addictive. People were used them innocently. They had no idea. But through repeat exposure, they became addicted. They started craving these foods. And of course, uh, then their foods are some, some foods are obvious. Uh, cookies, packaged cookies, homemade cookies. 
they're made from addictive ingredients. They're made from sugar, fat, salt, and flour and gluten. So they just, they hid extra high fructose corn syrup and bread, et cetera, et cetera. People use the products innocently again and again, enough to establish the addiction. And then again, from the tobacco model, they surrounded us with reminders. They got employers to stock the break room with these processed foods. They took out the cigarette vending machines and they put in the snack and soda machines. So they maintained availability. They expanded the convenience stores at gas stations and then the big box grocery stores where it's just impossible not to overbuy in those environments. So it's a business model. It was used in tobacco and now we have inside tobacco documents showing how they took these addiction programs from cigarettes and transferred them to processed foods. For example, the Marlboro Country Store is an addiction mechanism. You attract people to buying the cigarettes by offering them free logoed items and so that they develop the addiction by smoking the cigarettes and then you're surrounding them with reminders. Your Marlboro lighter and your Marlboro belt, belt buckle and your Marlboro jacket. And so now you have these sensitive parts of the brain, these craving centers in the brain. And now you're surrounded by reminders and triggers, cues, signals, which release those craving cravings in the brain. And they did that to children with Kool-Aid. Same thing. You bought Kool-Aid, you bought Kool-Aid, you bought more Kool-Aid, you had coupons that you could send in for free merchandise. You could have a free Kool-Aid dude or Kool-Aid man shorts and hats and shirt and watch and cassette player. So that one, a sugar is quite addictive. Sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Mm -hmm. And once the child was addicted to the sugar, then you surround them with reminders, provocation, stimulation. So that poor kid is supposed to be learning. They're supposed to be gaining life skills. And instead in this business model, they're plagued with cravings. So the craving is the craving is supplemented by the marketing and encouraged by the marketing. It's it's true. You don't realize how much you go out into the world and you see a vending machine or you see, you know, a billboard or it's uh, you're right. It is everywhere. So what mm -hmm. what decade did this start in this this push that you're talking so about? The tobacco industry came into processed foods in a big way in 1985. In three short years, tobacco bought Kraft, Nabisco, and General Foods. Wow. In three short years, tobacco controlled 10% of American food purchases. And the addiction business model is you make it affordable, you make it available, you advertise the heck out of it, you hide addictive substances in, and then you attack the youngest possible user, the youngest age. So it's the five A's of the addiction business model. Mm. And they did that in it just mercilessly. They attacked children with sugar, a high salt uh, like Lunchables. It was, it, it was just merciless. It wasn't the total beginning because in 1963, tobacco bought Hawaiian punch and Hawaiian, they changed Hawaiian punch from an adult alcoholic mixer into a children's drink. And they started the, um, the character punchy, the Hawaiian punch punchy. Which, oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the character was always so mean to the older man. Oh, she's punching an older man. So this was um, a campaign to empower children to uh, deny their parents, to rebel against their parents, to disrespect their parents. It's very, very diabolical. So you indicated it a bit at the start of the interview, but can you please outline some facts about all areas of life that, that processed food addiction affects. You mentioned raging and depression, certainly weight, but let's kind of just go through the list and understand how far reaching this is. Okay, thank you. So processed foods have been shown to, I'm gonna use the word cripple. 
Uh, the nice word is impact or negatively impact. But as I look at this, and I've been looking at it for 27 years, it's really a crippling. They cripple cell function. So they are, there's a lot of it. People eat a lot of like sugar and fat. When the cell processes that, it creates trash, debris, byproduct. The cell fills up with that. And then the cell, the cell is run by mitochondria. The mitochondria can't move around the cell and do what they're supposed to do. The membrane of a cell is made from little microscopic droplets of fat. If you're eating low quality fat or you're taking a cholesterol medication which interferes with the formation of fat, that membrane stops being able to function. That membrane does two incredibly important things. It talks to other cells and it controls what comes into the cell. There are little pumps embedded in cell membranes. So the cell stops being able to do those critical things. The receptors on the cell, like uh, the insulin receptor stops working. It, get, it just gets tired and it slides down into the cell. So you have insulin resistance. So as you go through the epidemics of today, you can tie almost everyone back to processed foods. Americans are eating 73% of their food in processed foods. And it affects every cell in the body. I'm going to skip ahead and then I'm going to come back. When I skip ahead, it's to say that when you get the processed foods out of your life, your cells go back to functioning incredibly quickly. Wow. You know, people say, oh, you know, it's going to take a long time. Mm, within days, like my experience, within days, brain fog, fatigue, raging irritability it just it just is incredible how quickly it happens these foods are inflammatory so they're also inflaming every part of the body that's why brain fog goes away we think it's because these foods inflame the brain so cravings are not normal if you start at the top of the body with the mental issues cravings are not normal people have had them forever but they are not normal. That's not the sign of a healthy brain. It's a sign of an addicted brain. If you have cravings, if you're thinking about food when you're not hungry, that is a sign of an addiction. Mm. So uh, what's happening when the addicted pathways are hyperactive and they're pulling blood supply to them, two things happen. One, the stress pathway activates because it's trying to compensate these, the stress pathways and the addictive pathways are kind of in a dance. If you become too euphoric, your body will release adrenaline to try to bring you back down to earth. And by the same token, if you are stressed, the addictive pathways will activate to try to make you feel better. Well, all that activity back there is pulling blood flow from the frontal lobe. So your brain only has so much blood if it's all going to the addiction and to stress there's not a lot left over for the frontal lobe. So now let's talk about epidemics of attention deficit, learning disabilities, memory loss, poor impulse control, poor problem solving, poor decision making. That's all because the frontal lobe, those brain cells which do those functions are not getting blood flow. So let's keep going. Uh, the ear canals could be inflamed, which could give you ringing of the ears and decreased hearing. Your skin is just a huge filtering organ. You could have all kinds of skin problems because the, the skin is overwhelmed with filtering these toxic substances. Mm. Just keep going. You know, asthma and inflammation. The sugar is it creates... Um, the, the little the LDL, the little lipoprotein, though, that's what gets under the skin, it's called skin, of the arteries and creates heart disease. It's not fat. Fat, we've, we've seen lots of different studies showing that fat is not the culprit in heart disease. It's processed carbohydrates. Keep going. You have the gut, which is full of 
toxic microbes because processed foods feed toxic microbes. When you get off of processed foods and those microbes die, your gut will suddenly start working again. The liver is full of toxins and it gets, it actually, a fatty liver is an epidemic even among children. High fructose corn syrup converts to fat very easily, much more easily than sugar. And that's really uh, the big suspect in the epidemic of obesity. The pancreas be can become embedded with fat and then you have diabetes. The, the receptors on the cells for, for glucose can become worn out. And, and so the blood sugar stays in the blood and that is what we call diabetes. It goes on, uh, joints. Joints are inflamed by processed foods and they hurt. It's one of the first things that people really notice after uh, headaches and so on, that their joints don't hurt anymore. It just goes on and on. Every part of the body, because every cell is inflamed, full of debris, membranes not working, there's stress inside the cell, um, and they all start working again. And that's the cool thing that like the factory settings are there. Mm -hmm. The original blueprint is there and your body will just start working again. Well, I have over the five years that we've had our online recovery community. I've seen many quote unquote incurable diseases just go away. It seems like such an easy solution. And of course, in, in many ways it is, but what do you say to those and, and I've felt this way before, who think I'm never going to get out of this. There's just, the, the urge is so overwhelming. There's just, my I, I've been used to this for years. I, I can't get out of it. What do you, what do you say for people well, like us? I, was, I will tell you, I was in despair on that question. Oh, for 22 years. I started out in 1996 with a handout. And over the next 20 years, I tried 14 different major attempts to help people get off the processed foods. I started out with a handout for the other mothers in my kids' school, didn't help. I wrote a popular book, didn't help. I got on TV to promote that book, it didn't help. I got a PhD in addictive nutrition, it didn't help. I wrote papers, I published chapters on this topic with my PhD skills, didn't help. I had a, pr a prepared meal company at one time, and now I know how ridiculous that was. It was so misguided. That's like saying to an alcoholic, look, I'm gonna deliver the most fantastic water right to your house. You're gonna <laughs> love this water. And when you drink this water and you stop drinking alcohol, you're gonna feel so good. You'll never go back to the alcohol. That's, so, that's how naive I was. But I did get the contract to write the textbook. It is a textbook. The Processed Food Addiction book is a textbook. It's, it's built on 2,000 studies. I wrote 70% of it over three years full time. I got wonderful people to write the other 30%. But I was able to look at, I think it's about 6,000 studies. And I built the case. I was surprised. I didn't know it would come out this way. But I learned two incredible things from researching and writing the textbook. One, this is a severe addiction typically. And there's a very objective way to determine that. The American Psychiatric Association, over 50 years of debate and careful research, has developed 11 signs of addiction. So I wrote a full chapter on each one of those signs showing the evidence that those signs are manifest in overeating. And I remember I wrote the first chapter and yes, everybody want, has unintended use. Chapter two, everybody has failure to cut back. Chapter three, everybody spends time at this. Chapter four, everybody has cravings. Chapter five, everybody has given up activities and chapter six, relationship problems. And I stopped and I remember just sitting back in my chair thinking, oh, 
Well, six out of 11 is the threshold for a severe addiction. And then I got it in that moment. That's why nothing I had done up to that time had helped. It's because a severe addiction requires very particular treatment. It's a very particular approach. You have to protect that person from this outside stimulation, from the cueing, from the triggers, from the signals, from the reminders. And the other thing I found in the book is that people have been deeply, deeply traumatized by having a severe illness. It does, it shows up in every way, mental, emotional, physical, even spiritual, people to develop despair. And not only will people not diagnose it, health practitioners are not trained in it, but they'll label it something else. Mm. They'll label it weight gain. They'll label it obesity. They'll label it overweight. And then you get referred to a weight loss program, which actually makes the addiction worse. Because when you don't get enough food because you're on a restricted calorie diet, you wake up another part of the brain called the fear of famine brain. Now you have the addicted brain cells and you have a food seeking propelled by this fear of famine. If you don't eat enough food regularly enough, the brain thinks the only reason you're not eating enough is because there's no food. And so it will propel you to look for food intensively. And it will propel you if you find food to eat it all as fast as you can. And so that has led to a diagnosis of binge eating disorder. This is all food addiction. Wow. And um, now the eating disorder community comes along and says, well, you know, when we tell somebody to stop eating sugar, they go and binge on it. So we won't do that. We're going to teach them how to eat moderately, which is a death sentence for a lot of people. It's much easier. I know this is going to sound contrary, but after 27 years in the field, it's much easier to not eat the food learn how to avoid the signaling, the stimulation, the triggers, learn how to, you can teach your brain not to respond when you're exposed to one of those triggers. That is a great life. You're not battling anymore. You're protected. You're, you're in this safe space. But if you're teaching somebody moderation, then you're keeping the addiction alive. You're keeping the cravings alive. And that person is in the struggle for as long as they're eating those those substances. Wow. But does this make sense, Julie? It does. It certainly does make sense. Yeah. I'm I'm really appreciating this conversation for a few reasons. Number one, so much of the solution nowadays to two issues is medication. And mm-hmm. I've fallen into that. My friends have fallen into that. Most of Amer- America has fallen into that. But what I, I, I really, as I said, appreciate you because you're providing another alternative that isn't in this med- medication rabbit hole. Another thing I'm mm-hmm. thinking about is, my gosh, if you look at the two things that take up the most time in American society, it's really technology and food. And those are two yes. things that we've become addicted to. As you mm-hmm. just very eloquently mm-hmm. outlined, we're addicted to processed food. And as I hopefully eloquently outline a lot on my show, we're addicted to, to social media. And if I, you go back and I look at my grandparents, they didn't have either of those addictions. So it really yeah. does show you that this has been pushed onto us and we're kind of enslaved to it. You're, you're making like three or four like fantastic points. So let's go back to medical services. In my experience, and I'm going to uh, own this personally, medical services make up about 20% of the healing opportunities out there. Pharmaceuticals, I'm dependent on a pharmaceutical. I have asthma and I will go get a a test. I I use Western medicine, I do. But I also use a lot of other modalities and we've created a whole new community to do this, to make it easy for people to work through, you know, dozens of other modalities and, um, and see what works for them before pharmaceuticals came along uh, in the thousands of years before that, whether you're a creationist or an evolutionist, there were thousands of years before pharmaceuticals came along, 
people did other things to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. The the human race continued on because there are many other things other than pharmaceuticals to do to feel better. Breath work, visualizations, meditation, movement uh, methods like Qigong, community, socializing, um, just a lot of other things. And they work and they work great. You are right. Diet is a number one. You've got to get the the toxic substances out of your system. And then the, the, the healing is really incredible. But you can only maintain that if you're in a culture where other people are doing it. Humans must feel normal. They must be able to fit in. It's a survival instinct. Yes. If you were in a tribe, you lived, they fought off predators, they fought off enemies, they found food, water, shelter, they raised your children. You would live, your children would live, and your genes would get passed on. If you were trying to do that out there by yourself, you, you, you would die. So that drive to fit in is paramount in a human's brain. And you can't you know, say, oh, well, I'm going to eat this food plan for the rest of my life. You can if you're around people who are eating that food plan. But your brain would rather have you eat processed foods and fit in than eat clean foods and be the only one in the room doing that. Yes. So that is why we created the online community. The, the screen addiction is quite real and quite, quite scary. Game, video game addiction is very real. Oh my gosh, there's a lot, a lot of research on Facebook addiction. I was surprised the first time I went in to look for studies and there were dozens. And of course it goes hand in glove with processed food addiction because you're so tied to the screen that you can't tear yourself away to go make a meal. Right. You might be able to tear yourself away and go get a bag of something that you rip open and eat. Uh, but yes, so so screen addiction video game addiction, social media addiction is very real and very related to processed food addiction because processed foods make you tired and they make you brain fogged. And maybe you've already slept 12 hours or you tried to sleep, but you couldn't sleep because you have caffeine in your system. The caffeine is there to counteract the groggy effects of the processed foods. But so you can't go to bed and you pretend like you're doing something, you're on the computer. So it's this vicious intertwined circle of cause and effect. You're right. Between foods and screen addiction. You're right, it isn't intertwined. I didn't think of it that way, but that's true. I I wonder, for the sake of time, we, we may have to have this discussion in a subsequent episode, but I wonder how we compare to other countries as, as far as these addictions. I know that we're the most obese of developed countries, but it seems that this doesn't happen in Japan, for instance. Yeah, less so, uh, although it is around the world. Yeah. There, I, there are 2.2 billion people who are overweight or obese on the planet. Um, The tobacco industry already had relationships around the world when they bought those processed food manufacturers. They already had the advertising relationships. Advertising works by bulk discounts, volume discounts. So when they added their processed food advertising on top of the cigarette advertising, it was cheap. They could do a lot of it. They already had the relationships with corner stores around the world. The tobacco companies just packed these processed foods, the sugary breakfast cereals, the breads laden with high fructose corn syrup, the candy bars, the diet bars, the soda, uh, the sodas and the, uh, the, the shake, like the shake products. So that is why obesity spread around the world so quickly. 20 years for an epidemic of this proportion is, is mm-hmm. nothing. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is around the world. Australia, the Arabian Peninsula, Europe, the UK. Now in South America, they're doing things about it. In Chile, for example, they have warning labels on products that are high in sugar, fat, salt. And it's very effective. They were able to reduce I think a soda consumption by 25% in a very short time 
Wow. By putting warning labels on the products. But in our country, the processed food industry is influential enough to stop that. We don't have warning labels on these products. The FDA is pushing back. They just issued some new rules about the amount of sugar, fat, salt that can be in a product labeled healthy. I mean, it's incredible. You look at these products. There was just a suit against a, an energy bar manufacturer. The energy bar was one third high fructose corn syrup. And the lawyers prevailed. And the lawyers prevailed in getting the word healthy off that product. And this is just deceptive advertising is part of the addiction business model. You know, they made these repulsive cigarettes sexy and they've made these horribly destructive products healthy. So deceptive advertising is critical too. If you're going to sell a destructive, addictive product, you have to make it look like something else. You know, I'll say this one thing and then I want to move on to the going through my diet or an average person's diet and you're telling me what I'm kicking out and replacing it with. But first on this point of cigarettes, one of my best friends in college is from a former Soviet socialist republic. I'm not going to say which country, but but uh, one of the former SSRs. And she one, one day we were, we were in college and she just pulled out a cigarette and she she had brought over a pack from her country. It wasn't she didn't purchase it in the United States. And I said to her, what is that on the cigarette box? And it was, I'm not kidding, I, I honestly wish I were, it was a, a photo of an aborted fetus. It was so, yes, it was so gory, it was so dry, I, I could only see it from afar, and then when I got up close, I saw how, how awful it was, and she said, this is what they do. In order, you know, they haven't outlawed cigarettes, but in order to prevent you from smoking cigarettes, they put these gory images on the box yeah. so that you are so repulsed by it that you won't even buy it. And so when you just said, boy, what a, what a difference it is on our packages where people are encouraging us to do it. And then, you know, I guess in other countries, they kind of go about it a different way. Anyway, I thought, I thought you in the audience might find that to be interesting, but I didn't know about that. Thank you for yes, telling me about yes. that. That's very, it was, it was shocking. It was shocking. Um, but it obviously didn't stop her. I know. I, I fear that this story is making her look bad, but it didn't stop her. But, um, I, yeah. I honestly, I'm grateful that she bought it because it was such a learning experience for me. I would have gone through my life never having known that, but Hey, I guess that's why you go to college. So let's, Let's go on here to my diet. <laughs> or again, I, I want to sort of uh, talk about what the, the average diet of an American is. But I, I have a lot of processed foods and I didn't realize before encountering Dr. Ifland's work that I had so many processed foods. So if you look at the past two to three days of my life, I've had coffee with, I'm sure, I, I asked for a lavender latte, so I'm sure they're putting lavender syrup in there. I've had bacon, which, I don't think it's processed because it's the animal. I'm gonna count that as not processed. I've had pasta with, you know, Rao's tomato sauce at the store, cheese. I've had a glass of wine or two or maybe even three. So, you know, you look at my diet and that that is, according to your working definition of processed food, that no longer looks like the plant or animal that it came from. So if yeah. you wouldn't mind a few things, how do I, which of those are bad or are all the things I listed bad? What do I substitute? And also, how is my life going to be fun if I can't have my uh, pasta or if I can't have my wine? Is, oh, these are such good questions, Julie. Um, let's start out with your experience of the last few days. Americans are eating 73% of their food in processed foods. And you see it go up gradually over time. And that is one of the criteria for an addiction. You're using more and more over time. So the whole country is meeting that criteria. That You'll see numbers in the 60% range, but there's a big problem with the definition of ultra-processed foods. The inventor of that system, that ranking system, put flour into the minimally, minimally processed category. Flour which is a powder. 
mm. which is highly, highly processed. Oh, that researcher just decided, oh, everybody uses that. So it, I'll just call it minimally processed. It's an outrage. So when you add flour to the percentage of processed foods that people are eating, 73%. I went in, I looked at the individual numbers and I made the adjustments. So you're not alone. You're not alone. Good. Um, all right. So or not what do you do? What do you do? What should you, where should you start? I know this is going to sound funny, but you have to start at, with the people around you because of that massive, overwhelming urge of the brain, the survival brain to fit in, you have to make sure that whatever you're doing is being done by the people around you or your brain will scuttle it. It'll sabotage it. So I'll give you some examples of how this works. Somebody comes into our community. We broadcast over Zoom over 15 hours a day with a live trained host, somebody who knows the science, who ha has been trained in compassion, who's been trained in deep, deep respect for what's happened to us, who understands it. 15 hours a day, we broadcast in a block, we take a break, we broadcast again, around the clock. So it's not 15 hours from morning till night, it's around the clock. Well, that means that any time your brain starts saying, oh, look, everybody around us is eating processed foods, we should eat processed foods too. You can open your screen, get on Zoom, or check out a video from our library or open our daily podcast and be instantly around people who eat clean, mm -hmm. who take good care of themselves, who get good sleep, who exercise, who have great relationship management skills, who are genuinely happy. So happiness comes from well-being. And when you have those toxic substances out of your system, and every cell in your body is firing the way it should fire. That is happiness. And most people have never experienced it. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that that kind of genuine happiness, which comes from the heart and soul, is infinitely more pleasurable and enjoyable than anything a processed food chemical can create. Oh. Not to... Uh, and it, it doesn't really take that long. As I said, you know, for me, within four days, the, the brain fog and the fatigue and the bloating, all of those things start to lift. You do start to feel better. And then as the days go by, your allergies, your skin uh, breakouts are getting better. Uh, pain, it's just plain old less pain. Your joints don't hurt anymore. You're moving around better because your muscles don't hurt. But that's joy. So in addition to surrounding myself with people who are eating cheese puffs with me, looking over at my producers. <laughs> whoever that might yeah, be. Yeah, whoever that might be over there, all four of them. What should I eat? I mean, what do I do every day? Just wake up and have a vegetable and a slab of meat? Doesn't that get boring? Where's the variety? So, so can you just walk okay. me through my day? What do, we, what do I eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And do I, am I allowed to drink? Or no? you, you, your interest in drinking will fall off. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of drinking happens at the end of the day because your blood sugar is low. Like I, I just like it on the weekends just to relax. Who, and the, the prepared meal company who was very, very worried about that. She said, I'm going to continue to have my glass of wine. I, I can't live without it. Said, okay. And then a couple of weeks went by and I was talking to her. She said, you know, I forgot to have my glass of wine the other day. And it's because her blood glucose had been stable. She'd been eating clean, whole foods, and her glucose was stable. She wasn't craving by the end of the day. All right, so what do you eat? You eat all the proteins. So whether it's an animal protein, and I won't go through those because it'll upset your plant-based people, or a plant oh, protein them. like <laughs> beans or millet or quinoa or amaranth or... Uh, even a lot of the, the grains have some protein in them. You have a fruit, apples, pears, oranges, peaches, blueberries, strawberries, cantaloupe. It's just endless. 
the, the fruits are just endless. You have vegetables, you have onions, and you have asparagus, and you have lettuce, and you have tomatoes, and you have uh, cucumbers, and zucchini, all those beautiful vegetables. And some people eat starches and some people don't. Some people are so sensitive now to carbohydrates. But you have the gluten-free grains, gluten-free. So brown rice, millet, um, quinoa, and amaranth are also gluten-free. I know they're not as common. You have sweet potatoes, which are fabulous. You have uh, butter squ butternut squash uh, and pumpkin and spaghetti squash. If you're wondering what to substitute for pasta, spaghetti squash. It's easy to make. You just put the whole thing. It's like a football. Mm -hmm. You put the whole thing in the oven for an hour. You take it out, let it cool, cut it in half, scoop out the seeds. And then as you drag a fork through it, it makes like spaghetti. Hence the name spaghetti squash. And you have all these great fats. You have avocado, you have coconut, you have olive oil, just the cold pressed fats. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a ton of variety. And the way you create more variety is with spices. Uh, yeah, you a, just have, those, you have the curry hack. powder and the chili powder and you have got the garlic powder and you have all the herbs. You have oregano and the herbs de Provence and all these fun salts. You have uh, garlic salt and Oh, it's just, it's really a fun way to cook. It's very, very easy. If you don't have any time, get a slow cooker. You can get a slow cooker for $19. Fill it up before you go to work and you come home and your your home smells fantastic. You've got this great stew or soup or chili in your crock pot. You, and that takes the least amount of time anyway. Fast food is not faster than uh, a crock pot. Wow. So can I have ice cream on my birthday? You know, you can make your own ice cream. I have made ice cream from, I know, this, sound, this is going to sound funny, but ice cream from blending frozen blueberries with coconut cream, unsweetened coconut cream. It's delicious. It's fabulous. Now, here's the big secret. You can make ice cream from avocados. You can blend an avocado with like frozen peaches or frozen blueberries. It's delicious. I'm with you on a lot, like my friend. Well. I don't know if I'm with and you on that. <laughs> my my producer would like me to ask you about acai bowls. Are those healthy? What is it? Acai bowls. Oh, it depends on what's in them. You have to just look carefully. Mm. What's look carefully, them. Zach. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. I, unfortunately, we are out oh, of time. Thank you, Dr. Ifflin. You, look, you may see me in a few more months. I may look totally different. And it will be it's because a different of you. life. It, I, it's worth fighting for, especially for children. I've just done a, a workshop for my community um, on the newest research on children and processed foods. The more processed foods consumed, the smaller the gray matter in the brain, the more processed foods consumed, the greater the anxiety and depression. The more processed foods consumed, the worse the executive function. These are children. Mm. Have mercy on them. I know withdrawal can look ugly. The screaming child on the floor. I hate you. I hate you. But it will stop. It takes four days. It's agony. I'm not going to mince words. It yeah. is worth it. Fight for your children. And you know, there is a different life out there. I mean, as corny as it sounds, I've seen this with social media. I've seen this as I've read the Bible more. I know, I know I, again, it sounds trite, but I didn't conceive that I could live a life where I would have energy and be so happy and, and not be so glued to my phone. I, ta you know, I, got, I got off of my personal social media and for a week it was weird. And then it was, it was like a totally different avenue opened up to me. And so I, I think it's just really important that people know you're not stuck in it. You're, there's, no. there's, a to there's a completely different option that you can't conceive of out there for you. I mean, imagine, 
I feel tired sometimes when I wake up and I get a lot of sleep and sometimes I think, oh, there, there isn't a possible world for me where I won't wake up exhausted, but you've reignited the hope in me that there is. So thank you. Oh, yes. Waking up ready to go. So it, if you're using caffeine, every time you wake up, you're in withdrawal. So That's no more caffeine for me too. I got to get rid of that. Going. No more caffeine. About. I, I can't have any more coffee. You'll be amazed. All right, baby steps. You'll hold me accountable. Thank you, Dr. Eflin. And remind her, everyone, that Dr. Eflin's book is Processed Food Addiction, and her website is processedfoodaddiction.com. Thank you. Hope to see you Thanks, soon. Thanks, Well, you know I always end the show by saying each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are, and clearly I should add on, and everything we eat <laughs> also shapes who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, act with principle and determination, and stop eating processed foods. <laughs> See you soon, everyone. Take care. <laughs>